to the podcast, and this is going to be our conclusion episode with the Renaissance, and then next episode, we'll be beginning to cover the Reformation, the other half of our first unit of the school year. Mrs. Basham, it's great to have you back on the podcast again. How's everything going? Uh, it's going really well today. I'm excited to finish up the Renaissance so we can jump right into the Reformation. Oh, yeah. Miss Bassett has been having a full day of teaching uh, on, on this Friday, so her voice is probably tired. But we'll go ahead right into it. Just a review. On that last episode, we covered the political side of the Renaissance. Where we covered uh, Machiavelli and we covered Thomas More, two of the more literary-focused figures that you have to do for our regular class test. Obviously, the AP went to go a little bit further in detail. So this episode is going to be a little bit longer than the other ones because it focuses on art, and that is the majority of the chapter is really focusing on those cultural changes that were established through that way. So let's first list off these characteristics that you're going to see in the paintings that we do today. Mrs. Basham, while I'm doing this, can you go ahead and just start with the first Google slide just so we can review who these four main Renaissance artists are that they need to know for our unit tests. Now, obviously, again, there's more than just these four. These are the, the main four Ninja Turtle-style uh, uh, Renaissance artists. It's an easy way to remember them. So I'm going to start at the top left. Uh, this is Donatello. We're going to do a, uh, one of the statues of David with him. Red is going to be Raphael, which we'll do the School of Athens with. We have Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. We've done a whole episode on Leonardo da Vinci as well. And then we have, finally, Michelangelo. We talked a little bit about him with Brunelleschi in the Dome. We were, we were talking a little bit about him about the Sistine Chapel. So today we're going to hit on the painting that we had in Assignment 1 about the creation of Adam, and that will be mainly a focus on Michelangelo. So just to review real quick again on this slide, some of the characteristics of Renaissance art, and that would be perspective, like the way you see things, realism, nudity is going to be something that's in there, but you didn't see that in the Middle Ages. Color, uh, the theme of this, which we'll get into, and uh, you're going to start seeing more paintings with regular life. Um, even, I know this will be hard to see because of the little box, but even my AP uh, textbook shows like a common person cutting fish in a market. And it just shows you like more of a Renaissance stuff. You wouldn't see someone pay to commission someone to paint a portrait of them cutting fish. And this wouldn't be something you would see before this particular time period. So then other than that, you have the accuracy of the human body. You're going to see more muscular style, uh, you know, sculptures, paintings, and whatnot. Because we can go back to another assignment that we had during the Middle Ages unit. And, and that was more of that Colossus painting that Miss Basham mm -hmm. found. It's very Greek style. And again, remember, this is what Renaissance is. It's a rebirth of older style Greek and Roman architecture, writing, language, uh, just cultural impacts. And it's, it's so Renaissance is really known as the birth of the modern era of world history all the way up and through today. So without further ado, Miss Basham, could you get us into a little bit about comparing Renaissance art to Middle Ages art? Yeah, absolutely. So let me skip ahead a little bit so I can get there. Um, so with the Middle Ages, these two right here, these are examples of Middle Ages art pieces. Um, and with the Middle Ages, you can see it's much more flat. It's not quite as 3D. Um, if you look at the table in the bottom picture, uh, kind of the lines and the shapes, everything, it doesn't look anywhere near as realistic. Uh, and also, if you look at the size of the individuals, so the top picture, you have Mary holding Jesus. I'm like, look how big Jesus looks. And that's a big old baby uh, compared to everybody else. And it is like that because they are the more powerful individuals in the painting. And so they represented power with size, I guess. Um, so that was one big difference. You start to see a little bit of a shift whenever we get to the Renaissance. Uh, people are more normally sized. Uh, and then... Uh, finally, let's see, the halos, you can really see those in these pictures. I'm going to see uh, if you all can see my mouse right here. The halos around them, that's how you knew that they were more holy, holy individuals. Uh, but yeah, a really big shift by the time we get to the Renaissance. They actually start to look realistic. We start to have more 3D. Uh, the sculptures, I think, really just, they look very real. They look human, I think. And yeah. we're going to look at the David statues. Uh, here in just a little bit. So big improvement. If you don't mind, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll <laughs> add this in there. Miss Basham, could you imagine if this was real? Like in the spring, congratulations, Mrs. Basham. You have a beautiful baby boy oh. of 22 pounds. Something like, it's like, holy. 
just like, what is this? Nope. That is really <laughs> shocking. I, I, lo- I, I really respect the fact that you brought up the, the holiness factor. Obviously, uh, whether it's sainthood or something else, you do see the religious, the more halos. It's not that you'll never see halos in Renaissance art. Every once in a while, you see a faint one or maybe a little more realistic halo. But it's just um, a little bit more rare. And just to build off of her on the perspective part, look at the bottom picture and look at the table. Look how flat the table looks. Mm -hmm. Look how flat the vases and the plates. It's like you're looking at an overhead view, but a side view of the people. And you're just not going to see that. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, it's almost like those drawings you'd try and make when you were like in elementary school. Yes. And there was no 3D aspect at all. It's just yeah. everything. But you're so proud of those paintings, man. Oh, yeah. When you're, you're a little kid, it's just like, whoa. Like, it's like yeah. a masterpiece. And I know your parents just must be thinking of how ridiculous it is when they pin it to the refrigerator, uh, <laughs> how, how amazing it looks. I, I, you're right, because it was a kid. Your perspective is just so distorted of what that actually looks like. And here's another thing, too. Uh, I don't want it to come off that Mrs. Basham and I are bashing, you know, bashing, <laughs> I, is are bashing Middle Ages art or Gothic art because in, in their own way, they're still magnificent. They're so beautiful. Gothic churches are incredible. Gothic oh. art is incredible. It's just that you're going to see more of a change and it's going to be, seem a little bit more realistic. And keep in mind, like we said a few episodes ago, most of the citizenry is very visual. The, 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 most of them are, are illiterate. Uh, to see more realistic visuals and paintings within the churches, it, it just hits home at you more and hits beyond. It transcends hitting you as a person, but hits almost like the way they would see in your soul. Um, I think the next part was transition Miss Basham to the Ninja Turtles. And we'll start actually looking at actual artwork. Let's start with the one that we've done on, on our first, mm-hmm. uh, I think, assignment that we had, our second assignment. You see the creation of Adam. Again, we've done the Walpurga assignment on our Google Meets this week. Miss Bashman, I've been just preaching to you to always look at the source. Now, normally underneath of this painting, there'll be a sentence that'll tell you who painted it and where was it at and what date it was to give you some sourcing and contextualization about what's going on here. What could the painting be about? Uh, now, most of you did not have trouble with that. Most of you understood what the painting was, and maybe that's also a product of where we live at today. Yeah. Where we started to have trouble at, though, was the focal point. Ms. Bashman and I had a conversation about that this morning. I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about maybe some of the consistencies, or I guess you should say inconsistencies that we've seen within the student's interpretation of this painting. Uh, so some of the things that I've noticed, and I actually made a short video this morning kind of explaining focal point. Y'all, it's four minutes. Just go watch that really, really quickly, and it'll explain it so much better. Um, but people did seem to be confused about the focal point. And so instead of seeing it as where does your focus go, the focal point, where is your focus, your eye, where does it go to? Um, it, I think people thought that the focal point was like the main idea. I had several students say uh, something along the lines of, well, this is when God created Adam, which that is what the painting is about. But that's not the focal point. The focal point is typically where all the lines and the color draw your eyesight. And so in this particular painting with the arms stretched out and everybody's eye gaze, it's taken right to the hands, almost touching. So that would be considered the focal point. Yeah, and again, maybe this is a little bit more on you and I, Mrs. Basham, because it's a product of starting the year off on virtual terms. And if we would have done this in class, we would have discussed, first of all, what a focal point really is. So we, we kind of relied on each of you to have your limited knowledge or, or massive knowledge of what maybe a focal point was and hoping to really hit on those and, and maybe you would have you would be able to pick it up. But obviously there's some consistencies there, but if we address it now and it's fixed the rest of the year, that's great. That's what we really yes. get to see. Um, just to kind of go into a, 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 the next slide, can you go to the next one, Mrs. Basham? We, we zoom in on what we would consider the, the actual focal point, um, like this, this main action that's happening, but also where does the artist want you to focus at? Um, we're going to see multiple examples of this today. I think in almost every painting we show from the Renaissance, there's a type of a, a focal point. Uh, and again, look at the shading. Look, look at the definition. This is what we mean by perspective. It almost looks like you could reach out and touch God or touch Adam in this mm-hmm. scenario. And pay really close attention to their fingers and look how limp Adam's hand is. And this is about God you know, giving free will to Adam. And, and Adam has to have the free will as a Christian to reach out and believe in God. And you can tell his elbow is resting or his forearm is resting on his leg and his hand is kind of limp because Adam is not doing 
what's expected. I mean, he's not, he's not actually putting in the effort to reach out to God. And, and that kind of goes along with the story too, Mrs. Basham. Mm-hmm. I think you would agree. Could, in a very PG-13 way, Mrs. Basham, could you also explain maybe the symbolism behind the nudity part? Because I know yeah, you, you and I have joked go. about this before, but considering that we'll, we'll be more PG-13 to what I usually teach it as, but that, that's another major theme about the painting. Yeah, absolutely. So I flipped back to the full picture really quickly. And uh, one of the questions we asked was, why is God clothed? Because he's the only individual there that does have clothing on. And, you know, people can argue different interpretations. Absolutely. If you have different reasoning or logic, so long as it makes sense, you're fine. Uh, But whenever we were talking, a lot of the things, Mr. Malcolmson, that we mentioned, the main thing was there has to be a separation between man man and God. Um, God is above man, and so this is a way of kind of separating himself uh, and kind of keeping himself, I don't want to say pure, but keeping himself covered, keeping uh, himself separated. And I had several Mm -hmm. students also make the comment of not only is he trying to keep himself separated, but some said, you know, God is supposed to be um, all-knowing, and you're not supposed to say, well, God is a man. God is a woman. So this also kind of keeps that uh, question mark, I guess you could say at the end of that, you know, as far as gender and God and how that kind of fluctuates um, by keeping him covered. And so finally, one other thing that I had a couple of students mention that I hadn't even thought about was whenever in the story, in the creation story, whenever Adam bites into the fruit, he realizes his nakedness and it's like that gives him that wisdom and that understanding that he is naked and God already had that. He didn't have to have that understanding because it was already present in his mind. So he was already clothed. He wasn't naked. So great responses on, on the question regarding nudity that adds really, really good thoughtful responses on it. And I've noticed that so far too. It seems like, the difficult part on our students so far is not really understanding the meaning behind the painting and the story. Many of them are surprisingly getting that, which is a great sign. Yes. And so an easier problem for us to fix is really just the tangible qualities of the physical painting itself that we need to work on. And obviously through practice this year, we're going to address that. I think uh, we're ready to move on to the next one. So this was one of the examples that Michelangelo did. Uh, now, here's another Michelangelo one. We've seen it on a couple of episodes so far. So this is the Statue of David, the more masculine version of that. Again, accuracy of the body. It's more muscular. It's also portraying the strength of humanity. And other that, that's new that you don't see in Middle Ages statues is that it's freestanding. Uh, so mm-hmm. you, you never saw that with Middle Ages statues. And that's another quality of Renaissance sculpture art is that these statues appear as though they're standing on their own. And it brings them more to life. They're not just against the shield like you would see before or against some kind of a, an overarching backdrop. So, again, it, it adds to the realism. But let's, let's do a con- contrast one. So we talked about Michelangelo's David. Let's talk about Donatello's David. Now, Donatello's David, as you can notice, in class we would go a lot slower at this, but this year being more unusual, we might have to push that to one of the activities we do in two weeks before we do our first test with that. But look how feminine the physique of this version of David is. Again, Again, church commissions the art. They hired Donatello to do it. But as you can see, the left leg of David is standing on Goliath's head. Um, You have the hat on, but you also have long hair on David this time. The way that his posture is, is more of a feminine pose. Now, I'll be honest, the church, the leaders of the church did not like this statue as well. They did not like how they portrayed David as feminine, uh, portrayed David almost looking like a woman. Uh, And again, But nonetheless, both of these statues celebrate something that's very consistent in Renaissance art, and that is humanity. Uh, The the, the strength of the individual, the strength of humanity, not just only God. And again, you wouldn't have seen statues about David before this era, but now it's like we're, we're seeing this praise within statues, within art, within writing. And again, we're not going to bring them up on, on, um, on one of the podcasts deeply, but Shakespeare is another great example of non-sculpture. Uh, his, his plays and his writing also shows the beauty and love and heartbreak and loss, and, and, and it just makes things so much more real. Uh, Ms. Basham, do you want to add anything to these two particular sculptures, just something that you got out of them before we move on? Uh, I think you've covered it pretty well. I think the only thing I want to bring up is the idea of humanism, you know, just kind of throwing oh, yeah. that vocabulary word back in there. 
uh, you know, and individualism, really focusing on the individual. And that is what these two sculptures, even though they're by two different artists, um, it's their own perspective, but again, celebrating mankind. Yeah. And again, one of the other main focus words in this chapter, it may seem like, or two of them really, they may seem like they're the opposite of this, is rationalism and secularism. So secular means beyond religion. It's something other than religion. It's more worldly themes. And again, you look at these statues here, you might be asking, well, these aren't secular because this is a religious figure. This is someone that's in the Bible. So I want you to know, it's not that all of the art and all of the sculptures were non-religious. Most of it was because the church was commissioning it on there. But you do see some writing that's much more secular, like Shakespeare, like Thomas More criticizing Henry VIII of taking over the church uh, later on, because you don't think a political figure should mess with the church. And this is not one of the many reasons why we get separation of church and state later on. But again, th remember these themes because they're going to come up for probably the next three or four chapters as we go through the year because humanism inspires so much, whether it's exploration around the world, it's scientific breakthroughs, it's new ideas in political enlightenment. All of those are going to tie back to this. So expect us to bring up that H word a lot uh, throughout the, the first part of this year. Yeah, absolutely. So let's see. Now, uh, just kind of comparing, uh, many of you know the Last Supper, we are in the Bible Belt. <laughs> and so uh, mm -hmm. I know my church has the painting of this hung up right there in the middle of the church. Uh, this is the Last Supper, and it uses, I think it's one of the best paintings, at using perspective to establish a focal point. Um, so if you go to my focal point video, I've also explained this one a little bit, but you notice the lines, whether it be here in their gazes, Everybody's gazing at Jesus in the center, whether it be the walls and the ceiling all focused in like you're focusing on the horizon uh, or even the windows in the back. You've got the largest of the windows here in the middle right behind Jesus. It really draws your eye and your gaze right here. Now, like you said earlier, not everything was secular. Obviously, this is a religious painting. Oh, yeah. Um, but it does show kind of the transformation from the Middle Ages, Last Supper, to the Renaissance. Not saying one's better than the other, but they are yeah. extremely different. And we're not saying that that's the only Middle Ages painting of the Last Supper right. either. We're just giving an example of uh, just the, the, the difference. Look how much more realistic the Renaissance one looks. Look at the definition on the faces. If you look close enough, especially on the better quality version, you can see mm -hmm. the cheekbones and the definitions on the face. So artists are starting to pay so much more attention to detail of people's faces, their bodies. So you're not going to see, the okay, for example, if this was a Middle Ages painting, Jesus would probably be much bigger than everybody else that's at that table. But everyone is in a relatively similar size. So you're showing the meaning behind stuff. Rather than showing holiness or power as a theme, you're showing accuracy now. What, what, what maybe did the real Last Supper look like? Or what maybe, can we make it look realistic, but also make it look still holy? Uh, like there's this light entering the room in front of their face, get the windows with the natural lights behind them. So it yeah. still does have like this, this bright kind of look to it. But this does change painting and change art forever because, you know, many individuals that we'll cover in my AP class had influenced the four Ninja Turtles too. It wasn't just them. But for our regular classes, we're focusing on our main paintings. But th that was a great comparison, Mrs. Basham. Oh, I'm really glad you found the Middle Ages one, so we put it up there. Um, let's see. So, do you want to talk yeah. really quickly about the sure. Northern and Italian? Yeah, I'll let you take over Italian. I'll do the Northern part and just kind of see what you think about it. I, I know that there are some uh, consistencies, for example, between Northern Renaissance art and, and Italian Renaissance art, realism is consistent in both of those. Showing detail is consistent. Now, you may have remembered a city. I know at the beginning of the slideshow, we put Florence on there again. We showed the dome of the cathedral. And you notice on the map that Miss Basham showed a few episodes before, I can't remember if we have it yet, Florence goes further towards the north. So you see that a little bit of that art kind of showing in. And further south would be more of your Roman art. And, and a little bit less than that. But as you can see in these two paintings that we've shown, you still show a muscular figure, you still show ac accuracy. So there's more of an, a focus on empirical observations, showing as much detail as you possibly can. And then, um, again, the realism part and paying attention to detail, but it's not as much of a focus on perspective. 
like behind the married couple, you do see it does look much more 3D before, but it doesn't have quite the perspective change that we saw in The Last Supper or that we're going to see on the next painting that Mr. Basham will kind of talk about. And then I can add a little bit more to it as well. But what, in, in the regular class, these two will not be separated as much. But in AP, you do need to know the definition between both of these arts. Go ahead. Yeah, and this is an example of the Italian Renaissance art, which you can see has far less close-up de close detail than the Northern Renaissance. So, I mean, you can see the detail in the faces, the shading, their muscles. And while this one is still very realistic, and there is still detail, as in there's a lot going on, uh, each individual is far less detailed. And this really uses perspective and proportion more than the other one. So, you know, with these, you mentioned the background and how, yes, it's detailed, yes, it's 3D, but there's not really the lines drawing you into where you need to be looking at. On this, I mean, look at the use of the archway and along with, you know, this focal point leading into the horizon right here with this far archway in the back. Uh, yep. That kind of was the main difference, I believe, between the Northern and Italian Renaissance art. Yeah, and I always joke too, again, you can see the evidence of the Renaissance again too. Remember, mm -hmm. Renaissance meaning rebirth of the classics. Look at the two statues on each side, uh, on, the, on the right side, on the left side, in the background, going down. These are like Greek gods. You're paying homage to that Greek past mm -hmm. again. And not, not to mention all of these different mathematicians, scientists, philosophers that are in this painting. I mean, there is Aristotle's in there, Socrates is in there, uh, Ptolemy is in there. So at the bottom right holding the globe is the guy that many students learned last year in integrated social studies. And we'll, we'll get to him later in Age of Exploration, which is Ptolemy, the first map maker. You also have the first ever photo bomb, Mrs. Basham. I didn't know if you knew that, but right here between the person in the white and uh, Ptolemy is Raphael himself staring at the actual, like, the viewer of the painting. So Raphael did, like, a self-portrait of himself in there hanging out because, again, think about um, Petarch. Petarch idolized himself as being like Cicero. He wanted to be there. You know, ask yourself about Raphael. Does he kind of wish he was alive back then in your mm -hmm. ancient Greek times, your ancient Roman times? I think that was a, that was a cool way to do that. You also have uh, Diogenes right here in the front of the steps, the famous philosopher that was a hermit and that he was extremely isolated and basically lived like a homeless person most of the time. <laughs> but there are so many other people. Yeah. All of us in quarantine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, I mean, obviously, one of the assignments we'll do later, we'll really pick apart uh, this entire painting because Athena, the Greek god, is in there too. Mm -hmm. there, there's many key figures in here. But this, is, this painting was made by Raphael for the purpose of a famous individual in the church's library. So this is in a library room, and there's two other paintings large like this that pay homage to different things. So he put famous people that he thought this person would have in their library. And again, again, you, so this is another one of those paintings where it doesn't have a religious theme. This is more of a secular theme, and it's more about mm -hmm. honoring the philosophers and the great thinkers in ancient times rather than just only the, um, the, the, the Christian or more Catholic religious view of them. So... Uh, Mr. Basham, I think this this is it. I think this is a good general run through of uh, just Renaissance art. I know we can go so much in detail. I mean, this class is in yes. college over just Renaissance art, but for our students and helping them on that college prep level class, I think this has been a great episode to to look at these paintings, and I think it'll make the their future assignments with artwork, even in political cartoons later, looking for mm -hmm. detail. All that's good. The only other thing I want to add, Miss Basham, is. So we've been getting some questions this week about what do we put in the, in the boxes on, on the assignments, you know, the little bullet points, and we put in the directions, but we'll explain that one more time. We divide the paintings into quadrants, and I don't know if we even have an example of that I'm we might be able to that. share. Okay, so Mrs. Basson is going to pull one of those up, but basically we divided them in, into, into four quadrants, and that way we're teaching you to slow down, like, Try to look in each square. Just look at three things that you see. I don't care if they're famous symbols like a cross or a crucifix or a skull. Uh, the colors, the shading, the, the person that's in there, the event that might be happening that's in that painting. But basically what students are doing, doing yeah, so here it is. You see where we told students, you know, look in each square. 
and then you have your source at the bottom, then you go down, and then you're just writing three things that you see. Don't overthink that part. Yes. Before you start answering questions, it forces you to slow down and look at every detail. So you look at your source first at the bottom, and then you look at each square and slow down. Obviously, after the first nine weeks or so, we take the quadrant square off, and then we just assume that you have the skills now. Now look at everything. Look at the foreground. Look at the background. Look at as many details as you can because an artist never wastes any space. That space is there for a reason, even if there might not be an object particularly there. So, you know, we've heard a picture is worth a thousand words, right, Ms. Hashem, through yeah, our absolutely. lives. You know, we make these assignments from scratch. So these questions, could you scroll down to the questions just real quick? We always start off with scaffolding questions like shh short, easier ones, and then we get into some more difficult ones. And like Mrs. Basham said at the, at the beginning of the podcast, which I think this is a great way to wrap things up, is that for the most part, some of you are just really struggling with these easier scaffold questions, the shorter ones, but you're actually getting the main theme of the painting. Yes. And the stuff that you're typing in the box is good. The, the little stuff, we can work on that. You're going to get better as we go through the year. So I, I, I'm relatively happy with what I've seen so far. Uh, for not having any, or having at least maybe very little knowledge about artwork and other uh, issues. So other than that, do you have anything that you would like to add, Mrs. Bashan, before we go? All I was going to say is a lot of this can be found in the source, and that's why we went over sourcing that's and contextualization true. with Walperga, is showing you how to read a source. And then, second off, if you are confused about anything, or you just don't get it, or the question's weird, or anything like that, please, 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 do not just leave it blank, do not write I don't know, something like that. Reach out, email, 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 send a message on Remind, comment on the assignment, I get a notification for comments, um, but there's really no reason that you can't just reach out for help, and I promise I will do yeah. everything I can, whether it's meet on a Google Meet or whatever. Mr. Matheson knows the same way. Same thing. Um, yep. If you are confused about anything involving the assignments, just let us know. Yeah. And no, I don't know is not an answer, especially if you don't follow up. I don't know with why you don't think that you don't know. Remember for us on these earlier assignments, it's not as much about getting things wrong or getting things no. right. It's more about being reasonable and reasonable meaning you know, does it make sense? And if you're having trouble, write it in the answer, write what it is that you're confused about. We've had several students, Mrs. Benjamin, email us that they've been super gutsy. They've been, they are upfront. Listen, I, I kind of get it, but I'm also confused about this. And then they kind of lead them into getting it and they eventually get it. They understand it. And those will be the ones that, that later on it will become much easier. But to, to, to give up, to just back off and not do anything, that's unacceptable. You, you're much better than that. To, to allow yourself to get to that point because someday down the road those scaffolding questions will go away and you just have these deep dive questions because we assume you will have the skills to look for those little details but we can't move on to that point until we know that all of our classes have mastered that so expect us when we do come back in person or whether we're doing things virtually expect us to still harp on these basics and these ver these, these diff certain ones uh, that are on there in the, in the scaffolding questions before we only focus on deep dive. The only other thing I wanted to add, just kind of building off what you said, this is the question where I had several people say, well, the focal point is God because he's the only one wearing clothing and the use of color drew my eye there. It's not what I was looking for, but if you explained it, because I had several people that explained it like that, 100% I gave them that, that question. Even though it wasn't exactly what I was expecting, they explained it well. Now, I did have some that just wrote God or Adam. No, yeah. because you didn't explain it. Now, if you wrote their hands touching, that's the answer. Okay, that is the focal yeah. point. But if you were going to put anything else, always explain, you guys, just in case, always explain it. Yeah, and you can assume, too. Look at the numbers next to the questions. Oh, sorry. If it has one point on it, you don't have to do that. It's okay. If it has one point on it, you can probably answer it in one or two words. If it has a focal point question, if it has three points next to it or two, assume that you need more than just one word to explain it. And like you said, Mrs. Basham, we're going to give credit where credit's due. Like if you try to guess and you thoroughly explain and justify why you think it is, that deserves some kind of credit. Even though it may not have been the focal point for the artist, it shows to us, more importantly, you are trying you are actually trying to understand it because there's hope there that you're going to get it because you're not, 
you're not giving it up. You can't be so quick to just like fall back and give up because you may not have exactly what you think the right answer the artist wants. To give us your best. Just try to explain it to the best of your ability. And if you don't know, like you said, reach out. There's so many ways to get a hold of us. You know, ask us for help. We would definitely take the time to do that. In a year where everything's virtual, we need to be available pretty much all the time. And we are fully aware of that or we wouldn't be doing this career. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I guess before we wrap it up, uh, if you have not subscribed to our channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe and the bell so that way you're notified whenever we post a new video. Uh, that way, and you know, you have our content. Yeah, and that's Mrs. Bastion's shameless plug again for our YouTube channel that's slowly but surely growing. And I will say, we've had several students bring up stuff from the YouTube videos. They will help you. Remember, again, we're not going to do notes in class. Uh, we're going to have very little this time for discussions more than likely this year. You're going to mainly get your contextualization about what is going on from those videos. And most of the time, the videos will help you so much more on the assignments. And we're trying to keep them short other than this one, which was a focus on a very broad topic because the art. But other than that, you've been trapped and now you are released. We hope you have a great day. And we look forward to having you back for the next episode, our first one over the Reformation. Have a great day.